all of you for taking time out of your busy lives and your weekend to join me this morning. I appreciate you coming to listen to learn more about visceral manipulation and the application to the pediatric population. It's actually 15 years ago this month that I graduated PT school. I don't know where time goes. But I never could have imagined as a new graduate that I would be today. based approach, I was having some resolution of symptoms, but nothing was long lasting. Well, as luck would have it, I moved to Arizona, and I started working in a clinic with Sheila Northcutt, and she used a manual therapy based approach that was developed by Greg and Vicki Johnson, that they teach the courses through the Institute of Physical Art. And so she started treating me with this approach in conjunction with exercise, and I started feeling changes in my symptoms. But again, it wasn't long lasting. Well, I started taking the courses through the Institute of Physical Art, and I met Greg Johnson. And during one of the courses, he treated me. And he treated me with their approach, but he also did some visceral manipulation on me. And I'm always the person in class being the demo, so I was open to this. And I started noticing significant improvements in my pelvic and spine mobility. So, of course, I started taking those classes. And I started feeling more improvements in my body, and I sought out treatment by several visceral ma manipulation practitioners, including Peter Coppola and Gail Wetzler, and started having even bigger changes. And I'm talking from, I had more than five years of numbness and tingling down my lateral calf. I had constant SI joint pain, low back pain. And if I ran more than a quarter of a mile, I would get a drop foot. And after these treatments, the integration of the exercise base, of the manual therapy, of PNF, and the visceral manipulation, I've been able to return to running on a regular basis and even complete two half marathons. That inspired me to take these courses and to want to share this information with others. But what truly inspires me to be here today is the patient outcomes I see, the changes in these people's lives that make me want to take these classes over and over again and share this information with you. This month I'll be completing my 29th visceral mobilization and manipulation classes between the neural and the visceral, repeating classes, lab assisting, TA, it's a lot of course room. But this is the place that I present this material from, from both a professional and personal perspective. And so I'm very excited to share this information with you this morning. This is the course objective. It's in your handout, so I'm not going to read it to you. But what I will give you an idea is an outline of what today is going to be like. I will be doing a section on lecture. We'll be covering what visceral manipulation is, how visceral pain refers, some anatomy review. Then Dr. Aaron Eckel will be speaking on the research section. And then I will be doing a demonstration lab portion. And we'll be talking about case studies. And at the end, I'll leave time for questions and answers. So with regards to questions during the lecture, manipulation. This is a manual therapy. It's an application of specific, gently applied forces to specific anatomy. So we're talking about structural anatomy, we're talking about the fascia around the organ system. This can be done in several different ways. And a familiar way to you might be what they call three Ds of tension. So this is finding an end field. Finding triplanar end fields, here's one point, here's another point that are tight. Applying the load, freeing up those structures. And that's a direct technique. What we often do, though, is an indirect, or 3DE. And so this is taking that same point of two ends of tension, 
and then bringing them towards each other and letting those tissues soften and allowing some viscoelastic creep to happen and fluid to get between those structures and allowing things to start to change before you apply that 3D of tension. So the image I'd like for you to think of with that is you have a bunch of necklaces tangled up, different sizes, all tangled. You can't just go in there and pull them apart. Sometimes you have to delicately push two ends together before things come apart a little bit and you can pull things apart. So it's very much that type of approach in terms of the manual applied forces. Why are we doing it? To improve the mobility of the, the contents of the container. So we're very familiar with treating the container, and now we're looking into the contents. And why do those need to be mobile? We need to be able to move and rotate because all of those contents anchor into the container. And so they need to slide and glide. The interfaces between organs, the ligament structures that hold them into the rib cage or into the pelvis. The example I'd like to give here is that we take up to 24,000 breaths a day. And with each breath, our kidney needs to move, and that's resting breath, one inch. So at the end of the day, our kidneys move nearly half a mile. That's a lot of movement. So what happens if your little one had chronic UTIs? And those UTIs caused inflammation to the ureter and to the kidney. And now the kidney becomes inflamed and starts to get a little adhered, and it's sitting on the psoas. So it just locks itself onto the psoas. And the psoas and the adrenals sit right on top of the, the adrenals sit right on top of the kidney, and the diaphragm's right above that. So now with each breath, that kidney can't move. So we start to compensate. Maybe the, the shoulder starts to come up instead of things dropping down. You start to see accessory muscle use. You start to get tension in the upper quadrant. What about the lower half? That kidney's sitting on the psoas. So every time I take a step in gait, it pulls on the kidney. Well, the osteopath believes that the arteries reign supreme. And they also believe that the nerves and the organs are kind of next in order. And so our body's not going to let us, with a step, tear a kidney or a renal vessel. It's going to shorten or inhibit the psoas. So maybe the gait starts to change. So now we have some breathing that starts to change. The gait starts to change. What about core stability? The psoas is important in that. Or flexion of the hip. So now that psoas wants to contract. But every time it contracts, it pushes up against that kidney. And the kidney doesn't have the slippery interface to move out of the way. And so now... Our body's not going to let that compression happen, so it starts to weaken the psoas. So our hip flexors become a little weak. Our core becomes a little destabilized. Again, that inhibition of the system starts to happen. So this is the idea of how infections, inflammation, problems in the body can create restrictions and then lead to potentially movement dysfunctions in the musculoskeletal system. So this is just that idea of image of the diaphragm, the adrenals, the kidney. Here's our psoas and the QL, and if it's adhered, it can't move, what relationships are starting to be compromised and how might the body start to compensate? And that was just a theoretical example I gave you. Everybody's body compensates differently. But the what ifs are out there, and the thought process of how do these internal structures affect our external movement and pain and function is what I really like to start to open your minds up to. So who started this work? Jean-Pierre Barral is who brought it to the US over 30 years ago. Now he's 70, he lives in France, he's in retirement, which means he bought an olive farm and he works on his olive farm in the morning, and then he writes in his book because he's still publishing. And then sometimes he does cadaver work because he gets into the anatomy books in cadaver at least every week, if not more, his entire career. And then in the afternoon he sees patients from 12 to 6. That's his retirement, 70. To me, that's inspirational. That says a lot about the work he does and how much he loves what he does and how much I believe in this work, too, because I don't know that I want to go quite to that extreme at 70, but owning an olive farm wouldn't be so bad in France. <laughs> so anyhow, he started out his career at the Lung Hospital in France as an osteopath. So he started out as a PT, and then he went back and became an osteopath. And he was working there, and he started to notice that patients that maybe had right upper quadrant pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, that if they passed on, when he did the dissection, and he, um, he would look at the structures, and he would see that that side of the body might have more adhesions than the other side. So he started to notice, and this increased his curiosity on how might 
internal structures be adhered and causing relationships to the musculoskeletal system in terms of pain and dysfunction. Well, he went on to teach at England's European School of Osteopathy for 13 years, spinal biomechanics. And that's where he really started to look at how the spine and the musculoskeletal system was influenced by the visceral system. And this is where he started developing visceral manipulation. And so he found that many structures will self-correct after proper visceral manipulation. So that's that idea of the artery rate supreme. If we free up that kidney, maybe that faulty pattern in the upper quadrant and the faulty pattern in the lower quadrant starts to resolve because it doesn't have to concentrate anymore. And so he found this relationship and continued to develop the work. So bringing it to the US 30 years ago, he continues to refine his work. He comes over to the US and teaches about once a year his new material, the new techniques, the things he's refined and changed. So this is an ongoing process of discovery as he gets further into dissection and thousands and thousands of patient, patient case studies that he knows. And again, really we're looking at that relationship of direct mechanical tension, that kidney stuck to the psoas that can't lengthen, or input into the nervous system, which is the idea that if that kidney is putting pressure into the diaphragm, the diaphragm is innervated by C3 through 5. So if it's starting to cause some confusion to the brain, maybe the brain can't quite perceive where it's coming from, it could potentially refer to the shoulder. The same way pericardial pain or myocardial infarct refers to that left arm. And I'll be going into this in much more detail later in the presentation. So why might the, the tissues of the viscera become restricted. So this is an unending list. Have your mind and have some ideas. When we have inflammation, just like inflammation anywhere else in the body, we have fibrin, fibrin, fibrinogen, um, ground substance, tissues start to come in and adhese things down. So in that healing process, there may be some dehydration and increased tissue density, lack of mobility, collagen fibers start to tighten up, and we start to lose mobility. So what factors could cause tissue inflammation? We can start with birth trauma. And the example that I'm going to give more specifically on this, I will show when I get to the anatomy slide, so it makes sense to see. But this is anything from the umbilicus wrapped around the neck, causing strains there, tubercular plexus traction injuries when you're pulling the baby out, the clavicle fractures, leg injuries, pulls, any of that kind of stuff. Infections, that, that could be so many different things. Pneumonia, croup, bronchitis, um, GI tract infections, viral infections, bacterial infections, anything that causes some inflammation in the gut, as things heal, maybe it gets a little sticky and things stop moving as well. The tissue becomes a little adhered. Surgical scars from congenital defects. So this example I'm going to give, he is now 33 years old. I treated him as an adult. But what I wish is that he had gotten treated as an infant. And so I want to open your mind up to the what ifs with this for the potential to, if we could get to children and infants and change things early on, maybe they would have better function later in life. Because he came to me at 33 and having had back pain in his childhood years, in his teens, in his 20s, nothing was resolving it. He had tried lots of different kinds of PT and strengthening, and he was very frustrated and heard about what I did and said, okay, let me try this. Well, under my assessment, things brought me into a point of tension right here in his body. And I looked at him, and I could see this little teeny scar. And I said, did you have a mole removed? No, actually, that was a surgical procedure when I was two months old. I had a pillar of stenosis. It's not in his paperwork, of course. He forgot to put that down, and I said, oh, OK. Well, did you have any complications from it? Well, no. I said, did you, did you have did you a normal childhood, growth and development, anything? He said, well, actually, my mom said that I was proud of it. I went straight to walking. I skipped crawling. Well, my brain went, skipped crawling. So you didn't quite maybe ever develop the proper core. OK. So I treated it. I treated some restrictions around his pylorus and around the lesser omentum. And he had much more improvement in trunk mobility. But he still didn't have that stability. So I had to integrate core stability, TNF, and other things to give him that strength back to get his core turned on. Because I really think if I had only done the visceral manipulation and the scar relief, he may have been more destabilized and had more problems. So luckily, he was compliant with the home exercise program. He came up for a follow-up visit, said, I'm feeling so much better. 
and he had a third visit scheduled, and he called me a couple weeks later and canceled it. He said, I'm feeling great. I'm going to keep doing what you gave me, and I'm good to go. So I, I look at the what ifs and say, he had been treated when he was an infant and had gone through the proper crawling and phases. Maybe he wouldn't have had that pain in his ch childhood years, in his teen years, in his 20s. So that was pretty big for me to think this one teeny little scar that was pulling him down and his core being shut off could have such an influence on his back pain. Sports traumas and falls. I will be talking more about that in my case study at the end, but the idea here is, is anything. You fall off a jungle gym, you fracture your arm, that's all we focus on. Well, that whole little body went slamming into the ground. Did anything else get jostled? Did anything else get turned? Did everything go back to where it was supposed to, or do they have some adhesions? Maybe those ribs got compressed and compressed into the diaphragm. What of those cascades may have happened that, in just hypothetically speaking, then as the child grows, this is still adhered and now they're compensating and maybe they start to get a mild scoliosis or maybe they have constant shoulder or hip problems or other things. That we just never caught it because the viscera didn't refer as a strong pain symptom. And I'll explain why it doesn't make more sense why we don't notice that in our body. We just compensate and adapt. Food allergies and intolerances. This is nowadays so prevalent. So many children are soy intolerant, or dairy intolerant, or gluten intolerant, or something else intolerant. And if they are eating those foods and those triggers, they are having inflammations. And so things start to become sticky. Now you can address this, but you have to get them away from the triggers too. So it can become a vicious cycle. But the potential of what those things can do in terms of creating restrictions in the intestines and whatever else could then potentially limit mobility of the pelvis and trunk. Medication, this is anything that dehydrates you or pain medications that cause constipation and slowing down of motility or bad reactions to antibiotics that cause loose stools and now you have a change in the motility of the gut. Do things get a little thrown off? Do things kick back in the way they're supposed to? And abnormal neural activity. So this is your high tone, your low tone, CP, anything. If you're in a posture for a prolonged period of time, we can work to stretch Sorry, microphone. Work to stretch things out, but what if it's that in that prolonged position you had adaptive shortening between the colon and the iliacus or whatever else? So we can stretch everything else, but we still need to address what may be stuck internally from those prolonged postures because they don't have normal movement patterns because of tone changes. This is just a list, it's not all inclusive, but just so you have it, some common structures treated and some of the structures that I will be demonstrating um, showing you in the case study of structures that I treated with the patients I've seen. So starting into that anatomy review, looking at again the idea of the container and now the content. And we're so familiar with the container and the musculoskeletal system. But if you look at the intercostals and the rib cage and the thoracic cavity and the diaphragm dividing it, and then we have the abdominal and pelvic cavity, we have the QL, the psoas, the back wall musculature that we so often treat from here, but what's sitting on top of it in here is where I want to start to remind you of. And all the fascial structures and ligaments that we cut through in anatomy to get to the structure, maybe respect and reflect back to what those structures were. This view is sagittal view through, and we're really looking at what I'd like you to, to notice is the peritoneal sac. So the peritoneum, not the pelvic contents, but the peritoneum is one continuous sheet. And it has folds in it, and those folds become the lesser omentum, and then drop down and become the greater omentum, and go around all the loops of the small intestines, the juvenile ilium, and become the mesenteric root. And so that's one continuous sheet. So if you have a scar or an incision or a strain or a tightening and you get something starting to pull, it affects everything. Do it on your own shirt. Just twist it up. You'll feel it in the backside. Try moving your arm. Try moving your hip a little. Anything that adheres into there affects the system as a whole. And that peritoneal sheath comes right up against the diaphragm. So anything that's going on within the peritoneum can influence the diaphragm important for later. This is the example that I was going to talk about, about uh, birth trauma. So what we're looking at here is the diaphragm. Okay? 
and the liver sits right in here, and it's divided into half by the falciform ligament that becomes the round ligament that becomes the umbilicus ligament that divides down and anchors to the bladder. And I like to think of it as sort of that old school tree sw or tire swing and all those ropes that hold down to keep it steady and centered. So that is a continuum of fascial and ligament um, tissue. So this young lady came to me at 23, and she had some hip tightness, and that wasn't really her primary complaint. Her boyfriend was a PT student, and he knew that I did some work like this, and so she came to see me, and she said, well, maybe you can help my hip, but I also have another problem, urinary urgency and frequency. I said, okay. Well, what are we talking about here? How often? What are your symptoms like? Well, I get up five to eight times a night. And I go about almost every hour during the day. Just little bits, all the time. And I said, okay, so, well, I've seen every urologist, I've had every test, they can't find anything, they told me I have to live with it. So how long this was, has this been going on? Since I was little. As long as I can remember. Wow. Okay, so what was your childhood like? Do you have any significant falls, traumas? No, no, no. Any birth traumas? What happened? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then the boyfriend says, yeah, but you had your umbilical cord wrapped around your neck. And she says, oh, yeah, but nothing happened to me. And I said, nothing happened to you. Okay. Well, the lines of tension and assessment went into this in her body. So if you think about the umbilicus and the umbilical cord being yanked really hard when they're pulling her out, what did it create a strain pattern or, or faulty tension in this relationship. And so treating this and freeing this up, not only did her hip mobility improve tremendously, she came back for that second visit and she said, I'm getting up once or twice a night. That's it. That's huge. My goal isn't to treat the organ and the function of the organ. My goal is to treat the fascial tension as it relates to the musculoskeletal system. But if we improve tension and homeostasis in the body, does the body start to self-correct and improve function? And this was pretty profound to me, that this could influence that so much. I saw her for one more session. She had a little bit of tension left. We did more, again, core strengthening, PNF, neuro-re-ed. She was good to go. Life changing. This is, again, to look at that peritoneal sheath that's a continuum. You see the left row macula and the is here. So the left momentum above the stomach, the greater momentum sheath below, the corners of the colon are anchored. Okay, I apologize, the lasers weren't working. Up in the right hand corner, you can see the phenocolic ligament. So the colon is anchored to the diaphragm on the liver side, the hepatic side, and the splenic side. All these structures are anchored, the stomach is anchored to the diaphragm. anchored to each other. If you're reflecting the stomach up, you can see the fascia behind it. There's the pancreas, the transverse mesocolon. All these fascial structures are adhered to each other. So there's some of these netter slides in the space between structures, but that's not how it is in the body. Everything's pushed against each other. There's pressure in there called turgor that everything will occupy its space. It's kind of like stuffing as many nerf balls as you can into a container. You can always seem to fit one more because they always just kind of move around and occupy and fill in that space. Looking at the liver, the right triangular ligament, left triangular ligament, anchor that liver because it's a heavy structure up into the rib cage into the diaphragm. The coronary ligament above it, anchoring it to the diaphragm. And that falciform dividing down and blending into that umbilicus and the uracus ligament. Just on anatomy, really looking at if they pull on those ligaments, how it is connected up to the diaphragm above. I love this image because it takes us back to cadaver lab. And we're looking at the small intestine, so the jejunal ileum. And you can see how they're all folded against each other. And if you could imagine all those folds, this isn't a cadaver, but this needs to be slippery as, you know, fish guts. Everything needs to move. Super slippery, lots of fluid between the layers. Because when we bend over, they need to move out of the way. And when we bend backwards, they need to lengthen. So everything needs to be able to slide and glide. And if you think of this like a bowl of spaghetti noodles, 
and you forgot to put the olive oil in it, it becomes one clump. And you can't fold over because it's a clump, and you can't rotate because it's a clump. But if you could go in there and add fluid back in or do t techniques that improve viscoelastic mobility and get sort of more ground substance and interstitial fluid moving, those things start to slide and glide. It's like, oh, I'll put some more olive oil, and you keep working those spaghetti noodles, and they loosen up. So we're looking at how this needs to have mobility for us to move and gait, function, fold, and live. If we reflect that out, it's anchored down again through that peritoneal layer called the mesenteric root of the jejunal ilium, so it anchors down across. And if you look behind that, that's the fascia of tol the back wall of peritoneum. And how it anchors across, there's the sacrum, the lumbar spine, your iliac <coughs> vessels. All those contents are sitting on top of that. And all of this needs to be able to move. If we have an appendectomy, that little appendix is cut out. If inflammation's present or things start to adhere down, those ligaments on the side are anchoring that cecum into the iliac bowl. So if they can't move properly, do you start to lose hip rotation or trunk mobility? Here's an example of an intestinal adhesion. If it's really adhered down, it doesn't mean that we're going to break this loose and free it up. But could we soften it? Could we get it so pliable that it doesn't limit function or mobility? Even in this case, where there's a whole lot more scarring going on, and sometimes they do have to go in and surgically lice them and free it up. But if there's scarring there, just like a scar on your arm, as long as it's not stuck down to the bone or over a joint and limiting mobility, if it's mobile, then you have movement and function. So just like this, we need to make sure that things are moving. The ligament of trites, this goes from the esophagus to the duodenum. Okay, this is a figure eight ligament that's made of 70% contractile tissue and 30% smooth. So it is attached to the esophagus. So if you can picture that ligament in this next slide, it goes from the esophagus to the duodenum. So if you have a whiplash and you whip your head really hard, that ligament can go into contraction or shorten, adaptive shortening. The duodenum is extremely anchored down. It's actually an anatomical reference on x-rays and in films. So it isn't going to move. Instead, it will pull on the esophagus more. And so you start to get this tugging on the esophagus. What potential ramifications does that have? Does that start to create more th thoracic kyphosis? Is that how your body chooses to compensate? Or does it pull in and you now have shorter neck or tension in the neck? And so we always think we've, we've had whiplash. Sure, you don't have neck range of motion. Well, what if it's coming from an internal structure pulling you in, and so you start having limited mobility in the cervical spine? And I treat this often, and many of my patients that have had any kind of whiplash, and quite often that structure will be tight. And the changes you'll get in cervical range of motion can be tremendous, and you haven't touched the neck. <coughs> this is with respect to the kidneys. The kidneys are one of the few structures that don't have ligaments that hold them in place. They're held mostly by the renal vessels that kind of keep them where they're supposed to be. They're in an adipose, adipose sheath um, and then held in place by the retroperitoneal fascia. But they're very culprit to ptosis. So your kid jumps off that top of the jungle gym and hits the ground, could the kidneys slide down a little and then stay in that position. It's also common in birth when the mother's giving birth and they pull the baby out. That negative pressure can cause ptosis on the mother's kidney. So those are some of the places where you might see this, that then that relationship between the kidney and the psoas has been compromised. This slide I like to, to reflect to the um, layers of the pleura around the lung and how high up the lung go and how the lungs sit on the diaphragm and the relationship between the pericardia and the diaphragm and it has a ligament that anchors it to the diaphragm. And I like thinking of the lungs as a standard size pillow in a king-size pillowcase. So you have that extra space below, that's that pleural recess. And it needs to be free so that they can expand and contract and move. And then it's anchored within the rib cage, And that needs to be free. And so if you've had bronchitis or pleuritis or anything else, how does that start to compromise the mobility of the lungs and then the surrounding container? And even more so, looking up where the dome of the lung goes, up above the first rib, What's sitting right in front of it? You have the scalenes and the brachial plexus 
and the subclavian vessels, that's the dome of the lung. How is it anchored? It's anchored by ligaments to C7, T1, the transverse process of C7, and to that first rib. So these are the suspensory, hard to say, suspensory <laughs> ligaments of the pleural dome. That if you again have that whiplash or the baby's yanked out during a birth trauma, is this potentially contributing to torticollis or other things? Maybe. We always look at the musculature and the container and not really looking into the contents of how that may influence it. And I've had, again, many cervical issues that have a component of this and the next slide that I'm going to show you influencing cervical mobility. Not this slide, the next one coming, but this too. I like just looking at, I love this image of really looking at how the pleura goes around and then divides into the fissures and sits on top of the diaphragm and the dome all the way up and those ligaments anchoring it up above, how it can influence the entire lung and the rib cage around it. This is one of my favorite images. This is out of Dr. Brawl's book. Now, I never learned this in PT school nor anatomy, but it blew my mind when I saw this, that the heart is held in place by all these sort of, I like thinking of like bungee cords. And it's anchored to the superior aspect of the sternum, so the superior pericardial ligament, the inferior, anchored to the diaphragm. But then what really surprised me was it anchoring up to T4 to T1, and then several ligaments that go all the way up to the cervical spine and wrap around the esophagus and trachea. And so again, a whiplash, or what about, I mean, as a kid, I had the wind knocked out of me, you get flat, flat on your back. What happens? The heart's getting jostled. But our body's not going to let anything happen to our heart, right? Instead, it's going to create compression or posturing that starts to protect. And how does that then influence kyphosis or a sunken sternum or whatever else? Just theories, but when you look at the anatomy, if these things have tension in them, it's not going to tug on the heart. It's going to tug on the structure around it to create the most um, homeostatic place or balance or the least amount of tension into an organ structure. One of the case studies um, I'm going to talk about has a little more to do with the pelvic content. So this is just uh, to give you that idea, this is a female um, pelvis how things sit. So we're looking at the psoas again and the iliacus. There's the sacrum and there's the pelvis and then it's uh, bladder or uh, excuse me, rectum, uterus and then bladder and all the fascial layers around it. What I really like is this slide looking at the ligaments that anchor those structures in and how those ligaments attach to the sacrum and the pelvis and how tension in them may put tension into the SI joint or into the spine. And then what's sitting behind all those organs? The neurovascular system. We're looking at the sacral plexus, the sympathetic chain, the lumbar plexus that's coming off. And then even more importantly, as it relates to the case today I'll talk about, is iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, and genital femoral nerves that run off of T12 to L2, come over psoas and QL, and then through the abdominal fascia and the obliques and then go into the inguinal canal to innervate the genitals. 